All right, um, we're going to go ahead and start our speaker series. This is the second week of Salty Sessions, a four-part series talking about coastal health here in Ventura, California. If you missed last week's kickoff series with Ventura Land Trust and Dash Speaking, you can find it on our YouTube channel. We have two talks tonight, and I'm going to uh, introduce our first talker. He's a friend and a colleague with the original uh, Surfrider uh, Ventura chapter. I'd like to introduce Brian Brennan with Beacon. Let's give it up for Brian. Obviously, great opportunity to be here to imbibe with some spirits and also maybe talk a little bit about the spirits of the ocean and, um, and uh, what's going on on our beaches. Most of you probably go down to the beach over time and just wonder Gosh, I was here three months ago, four months ago. Where'd all the sand go? Or in the case of some places, in the case of uh, sand disappears and comes back over time, and we'll certainly have the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about that. With me here today also is my colleague at Beacon, is Jim Baylard. He's a coastal uh, uh, oceanographer of science. He'll tell you, he's got lots of things behind his name, but Jim is one of the preeminent uh, coastal geologist, morphologist that knows where the sand comes and where it goes from, especially in this stretch here, uh, along the, from Santa Barbara to Ventura. Okay, uh, let me just tell you quickly about Beacon. It's a government organization started in 1987. It's, uh, the membership is all the coastal cities in the county of Santa Barbara, all the county, all the coastal cities in the county of Ventura, along with the two counties. So basically, we have anything that's the, basically the whole coastline from Point Conception, actually from the Santa Maria River, all the way down to County Line, or Neptune's Nest, as most of you would know. But uh, so that's a pretty great big stretch of coastline. And what happens up at Point Conception, what happens in Goleta, what happens in Santa Barbara and Carpinteria affects the sand that we get down here in Ventura. So obviously the big thing we're, close, we're focusing on is concerns about sea level rise. What's going to happen to our beaches? Are we going to have beaches? And if we are, what kind of, where are the beaches going to be and what kind of beaches are they? And by the way, beaches aren't just for us to put, play volleyball on to, as we call it, blanket space, but also beaches are habitat. Um, we're fortunate here in Ventura County and Santa Barbara County to have beaches that are still somewhat, somewhat wild, as I call them, and uh, back beaches and dune systems and all that have a lot of habitat in them. And we just need to recognize that, that we're not just the only ones that are part of that environment. Um, I'm going to introduce Jim Baylard for just a moment. You're going to get a quick science lesson, and when you get out of here, you'll be able to answer some questions, a little bit about what actually goes on the beaches here. Jim, could I ask you up for just a moment? Well, thanks, Brian. Yeah, when you uh, start to talk about beaches, you really have to, to think about sand and where the sand comes from. Um, and when you start doing that, scientists uh, usually uh, use something called a littoral cell. But that's basically sort of a, a budget for sand. It's kind of like a budget for your household. And you think about where the sand comes from, how much comes in to your stretch of coastline, where it goes, and, uh, and how fast it moves. And um, this is a view of the Santa Barbara littoral cell, it runs from nominally Santa Maria River down to Point Magoo, uh, but really uh, in actuality more from Point Conception on down to Point Magoo. And it's a very unique coastline in that it's uh, oriented west-east as opposed to north-south, uh, like most of the coastline along California. And if you start up at Point Conception, uh, you have a stretch that runs from there down to the Ventura River. And basically that stretch of coastline is characterized by narrow beaches backed by coastal bluffs. And that's a sand-starved coastline, which means that you have um, a limited amount of sand and plenty of wave energy to move it. And so as a result, you end up with really thin 
veneers of sand over what's called a wave cut terrace, a rocky uh, bedrock. Uh, and then as you move to Ventura River on down to Point Magoo, you have much wider beaches, and that's because you have a lot of sand that comes down Ventura River, and in particular, down the Santa Clara River. So if you move from west to east, at, uh, in terms of how fast the sand moves, it, it all moves from west to east. But uh, at Santa Barbara Harbor, you have about 300,000 cubic yards of sand uh, moving past that point each year. And then at, by the time you get down, oh, and, and that sand comes from local streams and uh, to a smaller degree, bluff erosion. And then by the time you get down to the Ventura River, uh, it's about 500,000 cubic yards of sand per year. And then that increase is really due to the input from the Ventura River. And then as you move further down the coast, you hit uh, the Channel Islands Harbor and you're looking at about a million cubic yards of sand per year. And that's because the Santa Clara River contributes really the vast amount of sand to our coastline. And then as you get down to Point Magoo, all that sand uh, slips into the submarine canyon and moves down into very deep water into the Santa Barbara Basin. And so as a result, as you go south from Point Magoo, or actually east, um, again, the beaches get very, very narrow. And uh, that's because most of the sand is lost to the submarine canyon. Go. All right. Okay, uh, just, just a quick look at what some of the beaches look like in our area. Uh, the first slide to the left is um, just down from Surfers Point. It's at the Ventura Pier. And you can see that's really the transition where, from where uh, beaches are narrow to uh, where the beaches become wider. And then on the, the right, you have the Pierpont. Uh, beach area and uh, the beaches are substantially wider uh, and you also have some groins in there that tend to hold the sand on the beach. And then here is uh, just down coast of the Ventura Harbor. Again you have uh, a wide sandy beach and backed by uh, sand dunes and this is really pretty much what the coastline looks like from there on down to Point Magoo. Um, here are some views of up along the Rincon Parkway. You can see on the left that you really don't have a beach there at high tide. And on the right is just a little bit further down coast. And you can see the beach is fairly narrow. And it's in both cases, it's backed by uh, a lot of rock revetment. In fact, the Rincon Parkway is one of the most heavily fortified uh, sections of coastline in California. So in, in terms of challenges to the future, um, we're looking at a couple of things, mostly driven by climate change. Uh, for one, uh, most of all of us have heard about sea level rise. Uh, that's due to the melting of glaciers as well as just the thermal expansion of the uh, seawater, of, of the oceans. And as the sea level rises, uh, it basically floods whatever beach you have. So since the, our beaches are a very gentle slope, if you have, say, a foot of sea level rise, you lose 50 feet of beach. And in many cases, that means you've lost all your beach. In terms of other, other um, climate change effects are, um, we're going to see a more frequent uh, severe storms, those tend to erode our beaches. Um, we're also going to see um, more intense rainfall events, and in some ca cases that will help our beaches, like up in Montecito, we, we saw just this past um, January, we saw some debris flows that were devastating for that community, but it also uh, really increased the sediment supply. So you have kind of counterbalancing effects. 
So I'm going to turn it back over to Brian. Thank you, Jim, for the science. And uh, one of the trivia facts you probably want to know is that uh, Santa Clara River, which starts out in the desert in Newhall, carries more sand to the ocean than any river in North America. And if you see an aerial of the river, it is nothing but beach quality sand starting in Fillmore. You could play a professional volleyball tournament on the sand in Fillmore by the time it gets to the ocean. So um, in, a, in, a, in a winter day out here, if you go up to Grand Park, and if you look out in a big swell, you can see out about two miles, if you look down toward the Ventura Harbor and just south of the Ventura Harbor, you can see waves starting to form. They're not breaking, but literally starting to form because there's about a, upwards of, they guesstimate, two billion cubic yards of sand offshore in that area that certainly has come out of the mouth of the Vint uh, Santa Clara River over time. Does anybody recognize this picture? Anybody been here long enough to, you would recognize, this is actually the area, this is Surfer's Point, the very top. And uh, now it doesn't look anything like that now, and you'll see some slides as we go forward, but certainly this is what really started the, the Surfrider chapter here in Ventura County. It's what got a lot of people waking up to building too, too close to the ocean. I might add that in 1987, this was project, the parking lot and all that area was in front of the city council here in Ventura, and the, and the uh, coastal engineers asked the question, how well, if we put the bike path in front of the parking lot, how long do you think it could be there? He says, well, it could be there anywhere from maybe 20 years to maybe two to three years. And it lasted about a year and a half. And uh, again, recognizing that um, we always think we can build in front of nature and overcome nature. That certainly, that was a wake-up call. So let me move on quickly. Um, you saw this, um, we talked about the beaches. This is the, uh, the winter of, um, I'll say, December uh, 2015 and January 2016. Probably had, we had the perfect storm. And I mean the perfect storm in the fact that we got, this is right here. Um, We've got extreme high tide. We got about a huge wind out in the channel, and we got a 22-foot swell coming down the channel. We've been able to get maybe one or two or three of those, one of those elements, or maybe two of those elements over the years, but never three at the same time. And that, as you can, might point out, the irony of this shot, you notice that the cranes on the pier, it was brought in to fix the pilings that went in in December, and now it's here January, and the same thing's happening again. So again, we, because of extreme high tides, because of sea level rise, we got extreme more, the tides are uh, moving in quicker. This, this is actually the backwater sitting by, almost by the parking lot, right there by the pier, overtopped. So just wanted, it was an extreme wave event. I don't think I need to tell you, you can see it's certainly the palm trees here, the, uh, up at the top at, uh, at Surfer's Point, uh, where we call it the parking lot. Um, interestingly enough, this is, uh, the city certainly had to deal with that. I think we've spent almost $1.2 million to save four palm trees, and we haven't finished yet. The question is, and I'm not, I, I, it, I, it's iconic, I, we've all got pictures of it, but that's what pictures are for sometimes, is to remember what it actually looked like when Certainly nature takes it on, and it, it took it on, extreme case. This is what the beach looked like afterward. Um, again, a lot of sand has moved off the beach. Cobble is underneath. Most of you wonder, thinking, well, gosh, where did all that cobble come from? It's generally been there all the time. The Ventura River brings an incredible amount of cobble to the ocean, and the Santa Clara River brings the sand. And in the old days before the harbor, the sand used to move up from the Santa Clara River onto their beaches here and cover the cobble. But once we put it in the harbor and the groins, we stopped a lot of that sand moving in this direction. And that would be in the summer months when we get those big, deep, dark um, south swells, which are generally smaller, but certainly still move up in this area. So that's what the beach looked like. A lot of people are like, gosh, where did the sand go? How long is it going to take to come back? Certainly this is, again, a little later. I might add, most of you are probably aware that the promenade area in the city of Ventura is probably the use, the most, the pier and the promenade are probably the most used public space in the city. And over time, on a daily basis, 
that's probably the most or majority of people, and they're like, gosh, where did the beach go? When's it going to come back? And more importantly, I'd never seen it look like this. But do I hit the? OK, got it. This is the um, top of Surfers Point. Um, this is the very, this is the area that I slide earlier where you saw a bit of the bike path and everything fell in. This is the same area as has been rebuilt. We'll talk a little bit about more about that later. But you see cobbles underneath. You got sand dunes back here, and it's working as a living shoreline. I put this in here to say also it's not just public space that's in, in danger. And certainly you see the rocks there, and this is up along Faria. I might add that almost 54%, Jim alluded to it about the rocks, 54% of the coastline of Ventura County is armored. And armored means it looks just like that. It has rocks in front of it. And so you can't get any erosion off the land, off the bluffs. And of course, when you build houses there, people want the rocks. They want to protect their million dollar houses. And they don't want, obviously, to move back or have anything going on. So we have no really sand coming to the beaches along a lot of this coastline. And I would say that uh, private property is certainly in danger. I don't need to tell you. I think Dash showed some of these pictures last week. So the understanding is that in, we're going to have to do a lot better job. We're going to have to involve the, it's not just public spaces that are going to be taken. Obviously, it's going to be the private sector also. Um, this is um, June of 2016. The date shows it. You can still see a lot of cobble, but you see a lot of sand up at the top. This is after the palm trees. The palm trees got stabilized a little bit. They came in and did some work to stabilize them. But what I want to point out is this is the, it's been 17 minutes. This is when the marathon started in, in uh, Ojai, and it's basically from the mountains to the sea. About 4,000, 8,000 people run in that marathon, 5K, 10K, and they came down, and it finishes right here. Now, a couple of years before, they had sand in front of the beach, and they were, well, this is what we're showing to both visitors and certainly people that live here, is that, gosh, where'd our beaches go? So that being said, there's nothing like a beach. I don't need to tell you. I mean, most of you understand we go down there for probably just recreation. We go down there for solace sometimes. We go down there for walks. Um, we go down there just at the end of the day to have a beer, to have a glass of wine, walk along. And we have some spectacular sunsets that happen here. I know David Poo and some of the folks have just some incredible, some of the pictures we're looking at in here are incredible. And I know I understand why it goes down there. It's but either starting off your day or certainly ending your day, there's nothing like a walk on the beach. So public benefits, obviously, private, uh, private benefits, certainly the beaches keep their property and keep their property value. And um, that's how it used to be in the past, certainly having sat on the Coastal Commission for a number of years, recognize that seawalls are not being permitted and the fact that they're gonna just have to recognize they're gonna hopefully invest in and look at ways of making sure sand and sediments continue to the coast. So that's why, that's sort of the beach. You can see obviously the private sector, this is down in the Pierpont. The sand dunes protect those houses. There are some rocks in front of those houses, but they're not, they're, and during a big storm, 1988, water was going through the houses down here in Camden Lane. So it does have a way of coming back at us. So beaches drive the economy, I think we all know that. We, both visitors and ourselves, um, where do we take our friends when they come here? Where do, to visit, we take them down to the beach, we walk on the beach, we spend money on the restaurants down on the beach, and little pubs like this, and all around town, same kind of thing. I mean, being in a downtown three blocks from the ocean is pretty amazing, but if I don't think if we had a beach to walk on or things like that, it might be a little bit different. I show this slide because this is, this is down at the harbor. Um, that's Island Packers out here on the left, excuse me, on the right. Um, but when the summer, this beach is filled up completely, and this is a day in the winter when the picture was taken. But the folks that come to the beach here patronize the small businesses down in the harbor, incredible amount of business. Just to tell you how it's gone, you don't, that the harbor parking has become such an issue that we've had to put parking on the street and actually starting to look at putting slant parking so we can get more parking in there. Again, it's, at the very top is Kitty's Beach, which is a very protected beach. Not a lot of swell, but as you move this way, it's, we have one of the, probably the most 
treacherous beaches in the, in the city, or if not the county, in the fact that on the south swell in the middle of summer when lots of people are there, I mean, there's a credible rip current off that beach. So we've started putting lifeguards there, and, and the lifeguards, people go, and they take, obviously, they feel safer, and in doing so, the businesses in the harbor certainly benefit from that. I show this to you because this is what people see they saw here this in December. They see this at different times. That's the face we're putting on, on our city at times and, and visitors. And I know when I was in public office, I used to get letters during the middle of the winter. Gosh, your beach, where'd your beach go? And what does it look like this? And why can't you fix it? And can't you build a seawall and do all those kind of things? And so that's a little bit what we're talking about here. And so federal funds, people say, well, can't you just get the government to give us money? Well. That, that well's drying up and probably should have dry and probably rightfully so in some degree. And that is we're gonna have to do a better job of finding ways of, of subsidizing our beaches. And I think probably the most efficient and cheapest and almost inexpensive way is to maybe try to figure out how we mirror, this, make it sustainable. And how we try to mirror as close as possible what actually nature's doing for us. We're very fortunate here in Ventura to have two wild rivers, the Ventura River and the Santa Clara River. Again, they carry sand to the ocean. 18 miles up the Ventura River, you know, we all know there, so the best way to maintain beaches is to, mirror the, is to remove Matillaha Dam. I think we've all seen this, and actually we've got some great pictures up here. But one of the pictures I want to show you what's behind that dam, that's chocolate milk coming over the top of that dam. And that's um, on a rainy day up. Matillaha is one of the wettest uh, spots in, in Ventura County. So that dam obviously is not doing any good. And more importantly, it's holding back sand and sediment that belongs down on the ocean. The reason I want you to look at that picture is because it's going to come in and reference a little later. I mean, it's, you know, it's dark. It's, it's like chocolate milk. If you look at the Ventura River when it's running, it's chocolate milk and it goes out, out into the ocean and goes out a fair amount. And as Dash mentioned last week, you can see the plume almost go to Santa Cruz Island on a really good blow, so, um, and a really good rainstorm. So obviously that's a sustainable way. If we could get the dam down, that, we could, that sediment's becoming a continual basis down. And this is the mouth of the Ventura River. And I show you that, and that, you see the little sand up there? And this is where the sand ends up coming to the beach. But look at the color of it by the time it gets down here. It's whitened up, it's cleaned up. Through sunlight, through churning, through everything else, it's got from being small cobbled to smaller cobbled, to almost grains of sand, to almost the white sand that we walk on. Okay, that's a little bit more of it. You see the little delta starting to form there? This sand is starting to fill in. If you go down, this was almost two years ago. If you go down there now, uh, you will see or start taking pictures at the, that's the little groin at the far end. It'll be filled in with sand here in another four months. Okay, that's it again in June before the fair, but you can see it was much, much wider in June before the storms came. I'll go back. Um, the perspective is, you see the cobble showing here? That's cobble, sand was on top of that, dunes were on top of that before, and that'll come back and it'll start that system over again. That's a living shoreline to some degree. So, and we'll move past that. And I show this slide to you for a couple of reasons. This is Ash Street in Carpinteria. This was taken, uh, the picture was taken uh, early March. Um, Sand and sediments, obviously Jim alluded to it, but the tragic uh, debris flow on Montecito, um, uh, while it was tragic for people living in its way, certainly I don't see, I, won't, I, I, I recognize it's been a tragedy and I don't want to make light of it in any way, but there has, what's come out of that is sand and sediments have come to the beach in a couple different ways. The, uh, in Montecito, those sediments came naturally. They washed down, unfortunately, it was tragically those people killed in that. But if you go to the beaches of Montecito, they're eight foot deep and about 30 yards wide. You weren't able to walk those beaches of Montecito probably in the last 20, 25 years. It was all rock and you couldn't go in front of it. So uh, th there is no silver lining to this, but I just want to say that is the natural process of how it used to happen. 
This is not so natural. This, this was, um, it, while it does happen through, through uh, the lagoon through there, but this is, we actually trucked sand and sediment there, was, was taken there um, after the debris flows. And that's when the, the highway was, uh, was uh, uh, closed and they had to get rid of debris. A lot of that did not come to the beaches. A lot of this is from sand and sediments in the upper debris basins that sort of are above our cities and above all the hills here to catch a lot of this before it comes down into the cities to become a problem. And I, that's how the, the, storm, the engineers looked at it over time. So we're trying to um, bring back more of those natural processes. So again, it's not pretty, but it's only been on the beach probably about six weeks and in six weeks in the winter. So not a lot of hot blazing sun and not a lot of opportunity to clean up or lighten up. But if you notice the colors, obviously the dunes, the sand that's pushed against it, that's quite a contrast. But that's not really what it looked like when it got onto the beach. It's a little darker here. You can see this is the sunlight on it. It's obviously wider, this, this stretch of beach. The berm was put in place where it's fairly narrow. It's added to the beach there. I think they put about 20,000 cu uh, uh, cubic yards of sand on the, uh, on the beach in, in, uh, in uh, Carpinteria. They also added some cobble back up in the, uh, in the lagoon area. Again, this was taken from the Santa Monica Debris Basin, which is about four miles directly up, s straight up in the hills above this site. So. In, before we built, before we put in debris basins, before we put in storm uh, 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 channels, this is how the sand and sediment used to continually come to the ocean. Okay, this is a picture and I wanted to make sure you see it. And this is the sediments getting put on the beach in Goleta. It looked very much like this before this. It was almost, it was dark. It was, it, this is the same chocolate milk you saw coming out of the Ventura River. It's just dried, and when it dries, it's much, much darker. And then it just takes time, over time as it dries out, it lightens up and bleaches out and turns into beach quality sand. The reason I bring this up is because in terms of sustainability, in terms of how we're gonna have to look at um, not just uh, sustaining our beaches, but also having areas and our uh, uh, private properties and public property and public spaces, we're gonna maybe have to endure this for a little while. This, by the way, this wasn't just taken there willy-nilly. It was sorted for grain size to make sure it, it reasonably matched the size of the beach, and also was tested for contaminants and bacteria. Now, bacteria, is, uh, E. coli, and things like that, it was tested for. But normal bacteria are in sand and sediments and carried by the watershed all the time. Some of the bacteria has remained in there. And so a few weeks after, they've been testing some of these beaches. While it was, they did confirm it was not E. coli, but there has been bacteria off the charts, and some of these beaches were closed for a period of time. But I'm just saying that in terms of is it ever going to be the perfect sand, the perfect, I think the only perfect sand, if anybody here from Camarillo at all or go on Upland Boulevard in that area, if you go on Upland right by uh, uh, the, uh, um, I think the old seminary, there's a flood control channel there and the sand is so white, it's just like the Santa Clara River. This is probably four or five miles from the beach. Again, that's probably the perfect sand to go to the beach, but we're not lucky enough to be able to get that at times. And also there's a huge cost borne by the trucking and transport to the beach and the sorting. So who pays for that? How do you make the, all those numbers work? I'm not sure, but those are the kind of things that we've been working with FEMA on, the Corps of Engineers, and those are the kind of things as future, well, taxpayers now and into the future, you'll be looking at and trying to figure out what are some sustainable ways. But I'd say that still the most, probably the best efficient way to do it is do it as best we can as mimicking nature as close as we can. This is the beach in Goleta, probably, I want to say, almost a year and a half ago uh, before the storms. They're putting rocks in because this is the area, I don't know if you know Goleta Beach, anybody went to UCSB, most of you parked there for free, I know, come on, fess up. But anyway, and walked up to school, that's okay, I understand. I think we've all done that a few times. 
But this is the beach in front of the picnic area. And by the way, there was a beach 20 yards, 30 yards wide here in this area over time. It's finally, it was eroding, 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 and the sand wasn't coming back. And they finally had to put rocks up because people wanted to keep a picnic area and a parking lot as close to the ocean as they could. So th what happened is that we rocked this up. The beach literally went away. In uh, November, I couldn't get the slide to load, but it'd show you the beach. At low tide, the sand was wet. You couldn't put a towel down on the sand because it was a wet beach, which basically means there's really not sand there at all. I mean, there's sand there, but not enough for you to be able to recreate. And certainly at high tide, the water was up against the rocks on an annual basis. So this is what the beach looks like now. Not the prettiest beach, not Waikiki, not a haiku garden, not, you know, everything you would expect, but it is a beach in rebuilding itself and coming back. The cobbles there, again, the cobbles underneath. Um, this is some of the rock area right here, but there's sand and sediments, and you, it's starting to fill in. By the way, this sand and sediment starting up there is going to probably take, well, we figure, two to three to four years, maybe five years before it gets down here to Ventura as it works down through the literal cell we were talking about. And I'll end with this slide. And this is, um, this was just, it was, this is uh, basically the second phase of the Surfers Point project. This is the, just as you come past the flagpole and start going up to Surfers Point. I mean, this bike path is again back with the one I showed you earlier, is literally getting ready to fall into the sea. There is a phase two for this pro plan that uh, Surfrider and the city and certainly Beacon and uh, city uh, um, and the fairgrounds who are working on to take that parking lot where you see those cars right now, and that would become a dune field, very similar to what's up above at Surfers Point, and that would basically come and go as the surf got bigger and they needed to take it offshore, it would move it offshore, and then it would move it back on shore as time goes on, and the dune system would rebuild. And that's what we call a living shoreline. And that's where you're seeing a lot of folks saying the only way we're going to be able to do it is respect nature, mimic nature, and when we can, try to enhance it as best we can. And so I would say this was taken at the beginning of March, almost a month ago. You can still see a lot of cobble on the beach here just south of the pier. But, you know, I think this typifies why we live here in Ventura. But, um, you know, I mean, it's one of those classic evenings that we're all strolling on the beach. And um, surf goes on forever. Okay. And, and we'll, I guess if you have any questions right away, happy to answer them. Uh, while we have uh, Jim here, he's, and certainly we're gonna, Dan's going to speak also, and then we can answer questions collectively. But happy to answer anything right now if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Actually, actually since we do have a little bit of time, um, does anyone have any questions for Brian or Jim? Actually, the street, the street will become the parking lot. And again, lining up. Right now, it's set up. A lot of people park there now. People say, well, we're not really gaining any parking. But also behind that, on the other side of the parking is the fence for the fairgrounds. We've talked, again, it's fair, the fairgrounds, who we have to respect. And to, it's certainly, you know, they put on a fair once a year. It brings in almost 350,000 people. They need parking very much like a mall needs parking the week of Christmas. The rest of the time, it's parking lots are half the size of the state of Rhode Island. And you just sit there and look at them, and, but they fill up once or twice, three, four times, maybe not in this era of Amazon, but certainly, certainly they're doing a pretty good job. So to answer the question, we ha that, the street will become the parking lot, but a lot of that is trying to figure out how we keep parking for the fairgrounds. And also, you saw some trailers, and they, the kids camp there while they have their animals. And there's a lot that goes on to putting on a fair. But truthfully, it's something that's you know only two and a half, three weeks. I'm not discounting it. I respect it. But that's one of the things with the biggest challenge of moving, was the biggest challenge to moving to phase one. And certainly is just, if not a bigger challenge, moving to phase two. But we think we can get there, and, and we hopefully can do that. And I guess I should repeat the question is, where would the parking be if, if um, 
if we take out the parking lot that's presently there, we would turn the street back into the parking lot. It would become the entrance and some of what I just said. Thank you. You had a question? Did, yeah. 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 Right yeah. 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 Yeah, so the Pierpont area from San Pedro to Greenwich Lane is armored with growings, and the Rincon Parkway is armored with uh, the coastline with rocks. Yeah, those, stay, those coastlines stay about the same year-round. They have the summer-winter berm, goes back and forth by a little bit, but they're pretty consistent. And then the unarmored sections vary a lot, like by the pier, even though you could consider that potentially a growing. It, it, it's a much more bigger swing from winter to summer and, and during storm years. Even during that 16 storm, the, the Pierpont area was about the same. Yeah, so is there, and, and I know you, I mentioned, you mentioned Coastal Commission is not approving any type of more armoring, but is there any option, what, what's the give and take of really the Pierpont area is pretty stable because of the growings and is there any kind of option to put growings or is there, what's your theory on that being well, thank you, and that's a, that's a great question. Um, I do have pictures, I didn't have it up here, I got it on another camera, that actually you would not recognize the pier point, pier pond, excuse me, as a resident, I should know, I got a picture down there, that actually I took a picture and it looked, the groins were completely underwater, the water was going, coming up the lanes about 10 houses, and so while it looks like the, 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 the amount of, a lot of sand was taken off the beach, and that would have been in uh, 2014, 2013, 2014. Um, a lot of sand came off the beach. The whole pier pond was awash. So while the sand, the sand cells are still there and the groins slow down and hold the sand, one of the things that's going on there also is the groins are actually sinking and actually going into, this, into the seabed. And so they're holding less sand. And over time, they will, while they're, they will hold sand, they won't be the, 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 quali the quantity of sand. The ask, you asked the question about the Coast Commission and what, certainly um, they've been, people come in for new, uh, up, for new seawalls, they've been turning them down. They've been saying, given the life expectancy uh, when you get a permit for coastal development of about 20 years um, in recognition of, of sea level rise. Now, that's under the houses we see now. Certainly not everybody's a Larry Ellison and can go down 90 feet into, caissons that go down 90 feet into bedrock and allow the ocean to maybe just put your house on pilings, literally. Um, some of that is certainly accepted technology. But in terms of the, rec of the seawalls, there's a recognition that seawalls both denude the beach and move the sand further offshore so it gets out of that literal cell that moves down that everybody benefits from. So I, 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 it, it, there was never any clear-cut answer, and of course that's what the courts are for, and there's been numerous lawsuits, and they still haven't been able to settle any piece of that. But um, I would say that um, while we're fortunate that Pierpont sits in that sort of middle sweet spot in the bay, certainly I think over time, if you look at the width of those beaches, it certainly comes and go, but it certainly is not as high as it used to be, uh, certainly back by the houses it is. But um, the Pierpont groin uh, sand field, uh, dune field, was, it was famous in the old days, and people used to camp down there. Unfortunately, again, we just thought that we'll just build as close as we could get to the ocean. So I'm not sure I'm really answering your question because you, you know, you, but uh, the other part of it is groin fields. Um, while I, I do think that's going to be one of the thing, uh, tools in the toolbox, that's interesting. I just had a conversation with the uh, Coastal Sediment Management uh, uh, Task Force for the state of California, and they're looking at some of that again. In the case of a groin field, you know, if you had a lot of sand and you could maybe, what it does do is, th is that amount of sand that stays in that cell, you'd almost need to have some of that sand being pushed down the beach to help, you're basically starving the beaches down that literal cell from that groin field because it's capturing that sand and holding onto it instead of letting it go down. But once that cell fills up, it starts moving around the corner. If you were able to backfill and put some of that sand 
further down or backfill into the next cell or the next cell, that might, be a, that might be one of the options that could go forward. Those are the kind of things that I would say that we haven't had to explore. I mean, we took groin fields off the, off the map 50, 20, 30 years ago. But you know, we, this is before we got serious about climate change and, clear, and serious about resilient coastlines and about how do we do that. And maybe in the case, we're going to have to look at putting groin fields in. You know? I mean, when you have a, uh, or people can do, uh, uh, create a geologic hazard abatement district, tax themselves, start putting money into it, and start looking at ways to do those. The thing that we need to get away from and is from looking at the man-made options and maybe looking closer at the, at the options of, of natural. I'll say this broad beach has been in the news a lot, the billionaire's beach, we all know about that. I mean, I had to deal with that when I was on the Coast Commission, but I will say that they've, they're now looking at, I mean, they were looking at barging in black sand from Vancouver Island in, in Canada. I mean, you know, not because they could, because they thought that was the only thing that would work, but they are seriously looking at taking down Ringe Dam, which is in the Malibu watershed, which is holding tons of sand, just like Matillaha is, and Ringe Dam used to contribute to Broad Beach. By the way, also, sand from Ventura County used to contribute to Broad Beach, and they called it Broad Beach for a reason, because, I mean, it literally went out, and the... Um, it, in 1939, they built the port of Wainimi and they extended the groin further out and so that they could create a deep channel. In doing that, all the sand that was moving down the coast got deflected into a submarine canyon, which has always been there, but the submarine canyon was further offshore. So we basically, are the sand was deflected into the canyon, it was acting like an auger and churning the canyon, and the canyon actually started working its way closer to shore. So that now, probably 40, 45% of the sand used to move around the corner of Point Magoo, would go offshore, and the first place it would wash on shore in Los Angeles County would be Broad Beach. Now about 99% of the sand goes in, if not all, 100% of the sand goes into, point, into that submarine canyon and never comes back. One of the technologies, when pumping and, and is going to be figuring out how we get sand back up out of that and back pass it and have a sand pipe that maybe goes to Hobson Beach. One of the projects um, Beacon is applying for from a funding right now is to look at taking the sand in the sand trap of Ventura Harbor, taking it all the way up to just to Hobson Beach, putting it on the beach in front of Hobson, and then mapping and tracking how that slug of sand works its way down, again protecting private property, but also protecting our state beach park. Emma Wood, if you've seen it lately, is almost unusable. So we have recreational spots that, while it is the public's gonna benefit, uh, certainly the private uh, owners are gonna benefit, so maybe there's that opportunity that we keep hearing people talk about that private-public partnership, the three Ps, is finally gonna to come to the forefront. But that would be a demonstration project to see about backpassing sand. One of the things we have to do at Ventura Harbor every year is clear out the, the, the sand trap so that the harbor doesn't turn into a lake, which it went, did two years ago when the Corps of Engineers was defunded at the time and couldn't, couldn't uh, uh, pump, uh, uh, dredge the, the, the harbor. Commercial fishing is very important to Ventura Harbor and will continue to be very important. So that's part of the reason the Corps of Engineers dredges it. So we need to continue that funding. But all those things start getting into a toolbox, groins, backpassing of sand, living shorelines, trying to get as much sand and sediment as we can, debris basins, maybe uh, uh, what we've, a couple things we've done in Santa Barbara, no, was not in the Montecito area, but we, in the upper debris basins, we've taken and sort of redesigned them so that sand and sediments, smaller, can flow through and the big rocks and all the boulders and all the wood and all the things that they worry about will get stuck in the debris basin so that sand and sediments can continue into the, into the creeks. So again, when they make it to the ocean. One of the things that was very uh, instrumental in uh, making sure, that, and part of that is I mentioned 1988, the, sand, uh, water, the ocean going through houses here in Ventura, it did the very same thing in Oxnard. They were mining sand in the, Ox in the river, in the Santa Clara River, and they stopped that 
and uh, two to th four years later, the beaches started building up and started finding its way out there. So great question. I think I went a little far afield of it, but certainly, but we do need to have, we need to have a toolbox that maybe focuses more on the sustainability and the natural systems as much as we can get there. I mean, and that's the only way I think we're gonna stay sustainable over time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian and Jim, for a great talk to start off tonight and uh, engaging us. We're going to take about a five-minute break before we go into talk number two. So uh, start your clocks, five minutes.